Hey, everybody. We have got with us Mark Olshaker. He is joining us. He is the co-author of The Killer Shadow, the story of the FBI's hunt for a white supremacist serial killer, Joseph Paul Franklin. This is going to be a great interview. Starts right now. Welcome to the Three Beards Podcast. My name is Craig, along with Austin and Chris. Passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century. Let me out. At this time, I would like to welcome Mark Olshaker to the program. How are you, sir? I'm okay. That's quite an quite an intro you have. I'm creeped out. Oh, awesome. <laughs> awesome. Hey, we're doing our job. Yeah. So, brought him on. He, they are writers of. I've I've heard you guys referred to as the modern, you know, Sherlock Holmes and Watson. You know, as I, I'm I'm Watson. I have to say. Yeah, yeah and so. We're bring, we brought them on to talk about their latest book, The Killer's Shadow. This is the FBI's hunt for a white supremacist killer. Why, I don't, why am I having trouble with this? Joseph Paul Franklin. Uh, this is um, this is one we've had a lot of people that have been asking us to do uh, kind of true crime, get some of an episode, and th- I'm glad that we're actually able to finally get there because this is this is fantastic. And for everybody mindhuntersinc.com is a website you can go there amazon pick up the books um like i said they have all right there just look it up but definitely from this one i mean i highly recommend you guys read this one this i was telling him right before the show this this is unlike your normal one where you have to read through the book to find out who did it i mean you know right from the right from the beginning this is who it is this is where we're going and we're going step by step. And it's almost like you're reading along with a case file as John Douglas and Mark Holshaker. It's like, you're going through there as they're recanting all the evidence, how this thing is pieced together, how they're found, how you, it's. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very well done. Yeah. It's, I don't think you want to scratch, Justin. I don't think you want a scratch and sniff book for serial killers. That doesn't seem like <laughs> no, very, uh, very, very, very t- tight. Um, a lot of people tell me you don't want to read it last thing at night either. So that's probably true. <laughs> I, I, I've been okay. I've been okay. I've been reading the book. I, I, yeah, yeah, it's not. Uh, yeah, my wife. Anyways, we talk about it at the dinner table, though. Oh, I. What is, what's it like being in your house? I mean, I can picture like from behind you. Is that like tables of crime scene photos? No, actually, information? It's not. let's see. Um, no, it's actually um, friends of mine who are British actors. Uh, their posters: um, Derek Jacobi, Patrick Stewart, Ian McKellen, all of whom oh, I worked cool. with overseas in my uh, in my documentary uh, filmmaker career. That's the other the other half of my career. But uh, no, thank you, for, uh, Craig, for uh, what you said about uh, about the killer's shadow. We we try to. You know, it's nonfiction book, but I tried. I've I've written a number of novels, and we try to give it a novelistic um, flair. And by that, I mean um, everything is seen from the perspective of my partner, John Douglas, who was the one who was actually the FBI's behavioral science and profiling pioneer. So, we, the reader, uh, you, the reader, get it as John gets it. And so, uh, in this case. Um, <clears throat> It would, by the time John was involved in uh, 1980, this was not a, uh, this was, this was not a question of 
who done it anymore. This is a question of where the hell is he and how do we get it and stop him and get him to stop killing. This was a man who in the course of three years had killed at least uh, 22 people, probably more. Uh, he'd also uh, seriously injured um, Vernon Jordan, the civil rights uh, leader, and uh, later became president of the Urban League, and Larry Flint, the uh, publisher of Hustler magazine. Both of them have died in the last year, but he tried to kill both of them too. Un so he considered those unsuccessful crimes because he, he didn't actually kill them. And Franklin's, uh, fr Franklin's um, MO, uh, his signature actually, was he would kill black people, African-Americans, mixed race couples and Jews. That was his mission. That's where he came from and that was his mission. And Craig, let me just say also, you had a little trouble with the name. Well, that's that's probably not accidental because that's not his real name. He was born, yeah. he was born James Clayton Vaughn Jr. in 1950 in Mobile, Alabama. And when he became an adult, he changed his name to Joseph Paul Franklin. The Joseph Paul part was for Paul Joseph Goebbels, the uh, the propaganda minister of the uh, German Nazi party, and Franklin was for Benjamin Franklin. So you can see how mixed up this guy was. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he. It's I. I posted a picture, like I said, of, of this guy, and it's just it's one of those. As you go through the book, it's incredible how. I, there was an interview, I think you did it with Mark Eddy on Nightlight, uh, where you said it. It's amazing the people, and I'll, I'll use your word, it's like, it's it's one word, choice. Yes. Everybody has this ability to choose, and it's amazing how, and you laid it out here, and I'll let you, um, I'll let you explain this part here, but basically it's just like, you can have two siblings, yep. one ends up being a serial killer, and another one ends up being, you know, a counselor. Or, yes. you know, or a doctor. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, let's get this out of the way right now. I would, um, I would certainly subscribe to the fact that anybody who kills somebody else in cold blood probably has some mental illness. I mean, almost by yeah. definition. That, however, does not mean that they are legally insane or morally or ethically um, not responsible for what they do. The point is... They have a choice about doing it. I'll give you an example of one uh, one case that I would consider legally insane. You um, you um, you have a guy who is, um, uh, and this is this is in the book too. Uh, this is in several of the books. You have a guy who um, kills young women to drink their blood, and uh, um, and he does this because he can't survive otherwise. He's put in prison. He can't get women to drink their blood anymore, so he starts um, he starts catching birds and snapping their necks and drinking their blood. And when he can't do that anymore, he commits suicide. That's somebody who I would say wow. that, that person is is seriously deranged. But Joseph Paul Franklin, people like that, they certainly have mental illness, and we can talk about their background and where they came from and all of that. But there is a choice you have, you choose to do this kind of thing and um, no one's forcing you to. And uh, we have an old cliche in, uh, in law enforcement called the doctrine of the policeman at the elbow, which is would you, this crime that you did, that you say you were compelled to do, would you have done it if there was a uniformed police officer standing right next to you? So that's and, a good, that's, that's and if the answer is no, then you've had a choice about it. Wow. That's, that's, yeah, that's incredible. I, it's you and a few of your interviews, like I've listened to um, between you and John, it's, you described it as a lot of people think it's almost like witchcraft, black magic, how yeah. you just, how you'll just come up this thing. It's, I'm pretty sure they were left-handed with one eye yeah. and they have dark yeah. hair. Right. And then it comes out to that. That's the case of people like, how the heck did you know this i'm like there's absolutely no and you're like you break it down and that's mm -hmm. that's the thing in this book too it yeah, takes you step I mean, by step how that occurred it's it's fantastic yeah well i mean first of all it's all based on experience uh, john and his um teaching partner at the fbi academy robert wrestler 
uh, when they were going around on these road schools. In fact, this is the subject of the first uh, season of Mindhunter on Netflix, which is based on our first book together, Mindhunter. And uh, so they would interview uh, incarcerated uh, serial killers and, uh, and repeat uh, violent predators. And uh, they would say, uh, you know, what's going on? What were you thinking about? And for the first time, really, they were able to correlate what was going on in the offender's mind before, during, and after the crime. And therefore, they could start using crime scene indicators to, uh, to start honing in on what, not the person themselves necessarily, but what type of person the police or the detectives should be looking for. And what they also did is they realized that, you know, a lot of criminal psychology was more psychology than criminal. So in other words, if you say to a, uh, if you say to a police detective, well, you're looking for a, um, um, a paranoid uh, schizophrenic. Uh, what does that? I mean, that, what does that mean to a to a police officer? Um, what does that mean to a detective? That's not helpful. If you say you're looking yeah. for an organized killer, uh, or a disorganized, or a mixed presentation, or you're looking for somebody with this signature, this emotional thing that he has to do to satisfy himself in the crime. That's much more meaningful. That's the kind of thing that's helpful. Um, you know, we all know the cliche of the white male loner uh, in his mid twenties uh, who is nocturnal and disheveled and all that. I mean, a lot of them fit that description, but that's not very helpful. You you need really important stuff. And let me get one more cliche out of the way right now, since um, everybody's frame of reference is. Uh, Silence of the Lambs and uh, all these mm -hmm. other shows, including ours. Um, but, you know, whenever all these characters that are based on John, whether it's in Mindhunter, whether it's in Silence of the Lambs, whether it's in Criminal Minds, all of which are based on John Douglas, each one of them, they talk about, well, he has this rare gift, or is it actually a curse that he can get into the mind of a killer and think like a killer or a predator? Well, I would submit to you that that's kind of basic. If if you don't if if you're a police officer or a detective and you can't think like a criminal or get into the mind of a criminal, you're in the wrong business. I mean, you really you should be there. So yeah. it's more than that. You have to actually apply what you've learned, and both by inductive and deductive reasoning, you have to be able to apply the what you see at the crime scene. Uh, or uh, or the dump site or what's done to the body or whatever and start thinking about what kind of person this is. I'll give you I'll give you one example of one that I sort of did on the spot. Uh, you all remember Mark Furman from the O.J. Simpson case. Mm -hmm. Well, he uh, he ended up doing a radio show in Spokane, Washington that was syndicated that um, <clears throat> I used to go on from time to time. And turns out in Spokane for at one point, they had their own serial killer. It was kind of a typical one. He was killing um, prostitutes who unfortunately are very easy to approach because that's their business. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had had about 14 or 15 of them by that point. So this was a, this was a major serial killer. And uh, he said, uh, well, we've got a piece of information that's been leaked out of the uh, police department. Um, they say that they have DNA, matching DNA, from nine of the victims, from nine of the um, crime scenes. What can you tell us about the serial killer from there? So, <laughs> you know, what do you say? So at first that sounds like, well, how do you, you know, so you've got DNA. So what? If you don't know whose DNA it is, what can you tell about this guy? But if you start thinking and analyzing it as a profiler would, you start thinking, all right, what does this mean? What does this piece of behavior, this, what, what does, how does this piece of scientific evidence translate into behavioral evidence? And the way you do it is you say, all right, these are prostitutes. These are, the victims are professional prostitutes. They are not going to let a, they are not going to let a, um, uh, a client ejaculate into them. So 
forget forget having yeah. that kind of DNA. Um, this guy has also gotten away with 14 murders so far. So he's he knows what he's doing. He's not going to bleed on f- at, n- at nine different sites. Mm-hmm. So what does that leave us? It leaves us one thing. It leaves us with the fact he must be going back to the body dump sites and either masturbating on or having sex with the corpses. And that's where the DNA wow. comes from. In other words, from the semen. So I would say, all right, what what I can tell you about your, uh, from what you've told me, what I can tell you about your unknown subject or unsub is, he's a necrophiliac. And he's probably somebody who uh, does not feel comfortable with women, particularly women his own age. So he's going to be kind of a retiring type. Um, he's going to be a blitz style killer. And if he's, if he is going to, uh, have sex or, uh, some kind with the corpses, this is going to tell you a lot about him. So that's the, that's, the, you know, that's where the sort of the black magic becomes real science or real technique. Wow. That's, that's great. I mean, that's, I mean, to me, that's what they it just, it blows your mind. It's like, okay, we got nine, you know, we got nine victims, you know, with, DNA things, and you just came up with all that. By the way, like, I thought I was right. Yeah, that's what, oh <laughs> my God, that's, was it now, was that the, uh, the name's family, was that the guy that was dumping the bodies over the in, bridge? In Vegas. Uh, no, no, that's Atlanta. That's, uh, that's Wayne Williams. Oh, Wayne Williams, okay, that's. That's, that's, yeah. that's another interesting case that John was involved in, and uh, it was a horrible case. I mean, it had the entire, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember uh, 1980, 1979, 1980, 1981, but uh, it had the entire community in an uproar because these um, black children and teenagers, mostly men, mostly boys, but some girls too, were um, were disappearing, and then their corpses would would turn up, and uh, it was thought that um, you know the Ku Klux Klan or some kind of hate organization is involved and they're trying to kill off all of the African-American children and, and create, you know, a new reign of terror, uh, in a place that unfortunately, um, you know, has uh, had really a, a very sad history of, uh, of racial injustice. So John Douglas and his partner, Roy Hazelwood, another instructor at the FBI Academy, they go down there and the, and they, go to all of these abduction sites where the kids live. They go to the dump sites and they say, this is not the Ku Klux Klan for two reasons. First of all, these kids were all from neighborhoods where a white man would have stood out completely. I mean, then there were no witnesses. Why were there no witnesses? If, if this had been a white man abducting children or, or even a group of white men, there definitely would have been witnesses in this, in this case. But also, there was nothing symbolic about these cases. If you have, um, you know, we all know the horrible history of, uh, of racism in the South mm-hmm. and sometimes in the North. I mean, when the Ku Klux Klan or other hate groups uh, does something like this, they make it very symbolic. They have a lynching. They, uh, they burn crosses. They leave the body out, you know, in an w- area where it will create the most terror. That was not being done here. Uh, and what, uh, and, and what John and Roy came up with is they said, this is a, first of all, they said, not all of these cases are related. Some are not, but the one of the ones that are, this is being done by a young single black male. And, turns out, um, you know, we could go through the whole case, but I'm sure you want to move on. And that's Wayne Williams fit the profile completely. Now, on the other hand, when we've got, we're talking about Joseph Paul Franklin, that's exactly what we got. But interestingly enough, he had been a member of the Ku Klux Klan. He had been a member of the American Nazi Party. He had been a member of the American States Rights uh, Party and all of these other right-wing white supremacist hate organizations um but he left them all because it turns out they were all talk and he was action um there's three different pictures of him um all three are mug shots i see and <laughs> in the middle sure does look like uh, his hero adolf hitler doesn't it yeah you can definitely yeah. see where he got the inspiration for that look yeah, yeah absolutely and Here's, here's a guy who grew up in a very dysfunctional background. Both his mother and his father were 
alcoholic. They physically abused him and his siblings. Uh, he ended up hating his mother. Uh, and when you have this really bad background and you've got somebody who um, probably has some hardwired problems to be psychological problems to begin with yeah. um, what you what you've got is in all of all of these people as they grow up I can I think this is almost universally true among serial killers and predators regardless of what their motivation is you've got on the one hand this deep-seated sense of inadequacy on the other hand you've got this sense of grandiosity and entitlement that the rules of society don't apply to me. I'm entitled to more than I'm getting. And this is all triangulated with a sense of resentment that society doesn't give me what I'm entitled to, doesn't realize my gift. And so they blossom into some kind, yep. of, uh, some kind of criminal. Now, in his case, he comes from the South, came from, came from a very poor uh, neighborhood, he came from a very race. He was born in 1950, so he came from a very racist background in Alabama. Uh, when he's 16 years old, he reads Hitler's memoir *Mein Kampf*, and suddenly everything yeah. becomes clear to him. It's not him. He's not inadequate. It's the black people. It's the Jews. They are the ones who are. Uh, they are the ones who are holding him down. And so, wow. In in a sense, to find meaning in his life. He become he he starts going to these groups, which reinforce what he's thinking. The first, the Ku Klux Klan, then the American Nazi Party, National Socialist White People's Party. But then, as I say, they're all talk. He's action. And one of the things that's very difficult for us is uh, it's very difficult for law enforcement to distinguish between aspiration and intent with these lone wolves, with these guys who go off on their own. But what he decided he wanted to do is he wanted to start a race war. I mean, he was, he idolized Charles Manson because he thought Manson wanted to char you know, start a race war with Helter Skelter. And uh, what's very interesting about him is, and this, we have to go back again, when he's like, six years old, he and his uh, brother are playing outside with this window blind. And all of a sudden, uh, a spring pops out, hits him in the eye, and seriously damages his eyesight. His mother takes him to the hospital. They treat him there. And they tell him, and they tell the mother after a while that she's got to bring him back for surgery. She never does. And he loses the sight. And I believe it's his right eye. He always wow. resents his mother ever since from that point on. But what does wow. he do? What does he do with this almost half blind guy? He compensates. He becomes a crack shot. He practices over and over and over again with a rifle. And he becomes this really good shot with one eye. And so he, he evolves into a sniper. And this is part of his MO. He then sets out on this, uh, you know, he, he marries young, you know, this young, inadequate woman. He has a daughter, he leaves, he goes away. But what does he do? He has this mission in life. This is what gives him meaning. He is going to create a race war. He is going to rid the United States and hopefully the world of African Americans and Jews. And who are the worst people of all? The worst people of all are white women who go out with black men or who have sex with black men because that's that's destroying the race and what's interesting is he considers himself a champion uh, a knight errant if you will a don quixote of of the white female race to protect them against uh, this um, this kind of breeding and this kind of uh, corruption so as he travels around the country and he travels all over the country, he's, that's one of the reasons he's so hard to catch. He's, he has yeah. several different means of killing and he has, and he can travel all over the country with disguises, with phony names and everything. So along the way, he picks up hitchhikers. They're always white girls, white young women. And when he gets them in the car, he becomes a profiler. He starts talking to them. He starts asking them what they're like. 
And if he gets any inkling that they've been involved with African-American men, he'll kill them. Wow. In other words, he's God. He gets to decide whether these women should be rewarded or punished. He's the wow. one who decides whether they live or die. Um, and what, what was it about Larry Flint that, that made him want to kill him? It's not that he was against pornography. He loved pornography. He didn't like the fact that Hustler had a pictorial in which a black man and a white woman were together. Yeah, I was just gonna. I was just gonna ask if it was one of those. If there's gonna be an interracial, you know, scene yeah. or something like that yeah. in, a, in one of the mags. Yeah, and he can kill up close. He can kill with bombs. He hmm. can kill by snipers. I mean, the one the the crime that we start the book with that he actually was the one he actually um, was condemned to death for is he he went went to a suburb of St. Louis. He looked around, found a synagogue, which had basically the conditions he needed, which was it had a place for him to create a sniper's nest across the parking lot several hundred yards away um, where he could not be seen. It had roads where he could get away quickly. And it had a big congregation that was having a bar mitzvah, and he knew when um, it, when they got out. So as soon as these people uh, leave, leave the sanctuary and come out onto the uh, sidewalk and into the parking lot, he starts shooting. He kills one and injures two other uh, two others. Um, his only regret was he didn't kill more, but at least he's on the he's on the way. This is this is important to him. If he doesn't kill. Um, he uh, he considered, and and I'll tell you. Usually, I can talk about the books very easily. With this one, his plot crimes are so complicated. I keep these cheat sheets in front of me, which all of, which my uh, researcher created for us, which wow. have all the crimes on them because it's hard to keep track of them. There were so many of them. And yeah, was, and oh I no, was, very correct. I was under the impression that he f funded his. His endeavor by robbing banks. Is this that is correct? Absolutely, Chris. You, you've you, you've hit it on the head. Now, what's very interesting is he's a really good bank robber. He could have spent his entire career just robbing banks, and he probably could have had a pretty good life. But that wasn't what he was interested in. He he robbed banks because obviously in his line of work. He couldn't have a steady job, but he was really good at robbing banks. He knew which banks to hit, which ones to leave alone. And this was only a means of a living for him. In other words, it supported his avocation, which was this creating, fomenting this racial war and um, killing Jews and African-Americans. Um, and so- yeah. You know, we would uh, we make the distinction, as I said, between M.O. or modus operandi and signature. So modus operandi is what you have to do to successfully commit the crime. And that evolves as you go along. If you if you're successful, you get better at it and you keep going. You, you learn more things about robbing banks or whatever or luring women into cars or whatever your particular crime happens to be. Signature is something you do because that's what emotionally satisfies you. So you could say that Robin Banks were a modus operandi for him, uh, being a sniper, using bombs, um, changing his uh, car registration, never using the same gun twice. Those were all MO. His signature was um, this compulsion, this need to kill a particular type of individual. And we have one case um, where he's he, he sets himself up. You, you'll remember this, Craig, from the book. He sets mm -hmm. himself up in the evening on a railroad trestle uh, and he's looking down into a park and he's waiting basically for a yep. mixed race couple to come along so that he can kill them. Now, a mixed race couple doesn't come after a couple of hours. He's getting tired of it. But wait. Two young boys, like te young teenage boys, two African-American boys on their way from their grandmother's house to the candy store come by. So perfect. He picks yep. them both off. And he's never met these people. He hasn't even looked them in the eyes. And yet they meet his criterion. So he is, uh, 
And that was Daryl Lane and Dante. Ob- these people are all objects to him. They, uh, they have no humanity of their own. I mean, that's one of the things about uh, all of these predators. They have no, you know, one of the things that separates us from them, I hope, is they have no compassion, no empathy, no sense that anybody else has any rights. It's only their rights. So yeah, his, you, it's, no, go ahead. I was, I was just like, his thing is like for me, it was, it was the sophistication that he put into this thing because yes. there was so much, it, it wasn't just somebody that just like driving around like, oh my God, I got to kill that person. I mean, there no. was like planning. I mean, like you said, killing Daryl Lane and Dante Evans Brown in Cincinnati. Like you said, mm-hmm. those ones, um, there's also the couple um, that where he went in the parking lot. Yes. He's, he's circled around. Yes trying to find him and it was this was one of those he was looking for opportunity it wasn't just like the dog told me like son of sam like the dog told me to kill this person this one was just he was looking for the appropriate time i can escape he had all these plans on how to get away with it and this is he's not like a spree killer who wants to go out in a blaze of glory this is not somebody who's playing an end game this is someone who expects to get away for from it uh, th- from from the scene, he's planned it very carefully. Um, in the um, in in the synagogue uh, shooting outside of St. Louis, he's he, he plants the gun there uh, ahead of time. He takes it away in a um, in a guitar case. Um, he's re- he, he's it, he's already filed off the number, and he's going to get rid of the gun uh, serial number. He's going to get rid of the gun right away. I mean, this is somebody who's thought out meticulously every aspect of it is he crazy well he's certainly mentally ill but Mm -hmm. you know you can't do that i don't i submit you can't do that level of planning you can't have that much ability to move around the country you can't have uh, that ability to use so many different weapon systems so efficiently uh planning like that and um and and be crazy i mean as you know, most seriously mentally ill people, they're victims generally. They're, they're not they are not the uh, perpetrators. With that word being said, that I think that word should be reevaluated, the word crazy, because there's no way. Yes, he might have a couple screws loose, but there's no way you strategically plan every crime that you right. commit on roads, how to get out. You know, crazy people just kill people. Yeah. So well, let me, let, let me submit another possibility to you, Chris. Instead of crazy, what if we substitute the word evil? How do you feel about that? That one, that one goes to a pretty good fit. And, and you struck my interest a few seconds ago when you said that he never used the same firearm in any of his crimes. But if I recall, wasn't he caught with one of the firearms that they confiscated? He was something? caught with a gun. He, he, when he was caught in a parking lot in Florence, Kentucky, um, he had a gun in the car. He hadn't used it yet. Uh, uh, and he hadn't expected, this was, um, uh, this was one of these typical situations, just like the son of Sam, who's caught because he gets a parking ticket for, uh, not be, for, for parking in, in illegally in front of a fire hydrant. Um, this guy's sitting in a, ho- in a motel room uh, with, a, uh, with a parking area in the center of the motel. And somebody's making a lot of noise. He complains. Then the guy's got his car parked, so he's parked in. He keeps calling the police and telling them to come and uh, and get rid of this guy who's in the in the room next to him. And the police come and they say, "Hey, guess what? Look at what we got here." They run the plates. They find the car is uh, they find the the, the car is uh, is hot. Uh, the plates are hot. They arrest him. They take him into uh, the Florence police station. Uh, they interrogate him. This guy is, you know, there's probably something about him that they don't like. Um, they step out for a few minutes. He escapes through a window. And that's when John Douglas wow. came in, um, because at this point, they uh, all the police agencies in this area are saying, you know, maybe this guy is good for our crime, you know, that we're, whether it's Cincinnati or whether it's uh, St. Louis or Pittsburgh or uh, wherever. Uh, maybe this guy is good for it. And so uh, the civil rights division of the FBI comes to John. This is very early in the profiling program. This is 1980. 
So um, the profiling program is very much on the line here at this point. Uh, they've gotten requests from uh, police departments around the country, but this is their first request from headquarters to do something and they and do it quick. Give us a fugitive assessment on this guy. Where is he likely to show up? What's he likely to do? Where are we likely to find him? And do it quickly because one thing we know about this guy is the Secret Service tells us he wrote a letter in 1976 to then candidate Jimmy Carter uh, complaining about Carter's racial policies and this idea that he wanted uh, racial equality for the races. And mm -hmm. now Carter is making a swing through the South on his reelection campaign. And this guy's down there somewhere. Do we have a do we have a presidential assassin on the loose? So the stakes are very, very high. Yeah, and it, um, I was like one of the things like while you were telling that, I remember that part is on page 53 on the book. You say looking at these possibly linked crimes, what impressed me was the degree of cooperation between law enforcement. Yeah, and you don't always get that. And that's yeah, and the, and the way you the way you described it too was just here you have because I think what was the quote um, the 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 long standing joke is that if you want to get away with you know you just drag the body across the county or state line mm -hmm. and then you'll get away with it yep and it is but this one like in this case everybody started comparing notes mm -hmm. like I have a guy with this tattoo this eagle tattoo oh really because I that, that's what we have and they started comparing these notes which was um, which is one of the keys that helped catch catch this guy yeah. and what's interesting is maybe this is a sign of the times but with e with so many of these cases the first thing law enforcement says publicly is no this is this is a random crime this is this is this is not racially motivated this is not a hate crime and of course they all were oh yeah um yeah one of the things too in, in like i said i really really like is that you guys have made a priority to focus on the victims and their Absolutely. families. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because this is so important. We, uh, we've tried through all of our books and I think this is like the eighth or ninth we've done together so far. Um, but there are no uh, Hannibal lectors in the world. Uh, fortunately, there are no none of these charismatic type, uh, um, brilliant serial killers. These are all these are all life's losers. These are these are really bad people and really inadequate people. And mm -hmm. uh, and so we talk about them catching them, but the real focus is always on the victim. And any good police officer, any good detective will tell you the victim is who they're working for. I mean, that's that's what's important. Um, you know, there's a we, we've had a lot of talk these days about police policing and race and community relations and all that. And look, any, you know, a lot of it's true. There's no question about that. But any of the really good, dedicated policemen, of which there are many, which there are most, they are interested in catching the bad guys and helping the victims. And then just kind of, kind of break a little bit, you know, kind of before where I didn't really get to it in the beginning. I, sorry, I wanted to get right to the meat of the story. Mm -hmm. um, is how did you and John first link up? This is very interesting, actually. Uh, I am, uh, I am started out in journalism as most of us did who were in the writing business and I uh, and I'd spent a lot of time writing and producing documentary films mostly for PBS I'd written uh, several um, thriller novels my first one was called Einstein's brain which did pretty well and um, and I've written a number of uh, books since then and uh, then around the I like most of many of us, I read the novel novels Red Dragon and Silence of the Lambs by Thomas Harris. Mm -hmm. And when I found out that they were making a movie out of Silence of the Lambs, I called the executive producer of Nova, the PBS science series in Boston. Uh, her name is Paula Apsell. And I said, Paula, 
um, this, I read this book, Silence of the Lambs. It's really interesting. Um, they're making a movie of it. And if the movie's any good, I think it'll be a big hit. I didn't realize how big a hit it would be. So I said, you know, serial killers and profilers weren't a thing yet at that point. Oh, and no. I said, why don't, why don't we see if we can do a show about the real profilers at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, and, you know, how they come up with these profiles and, uh, and, you know, take us through a couple of cases. And at first she said, well, you know, that's kind of soft science. It's all psychology. And I said, yeah, but I think it's a really good idea. She said, all right, we'll look into it and see. So this was before 9-11, obviously. This was before um, the whole idea of profiling became very popular in, in the public imagination. So I called um, public relations, the FBI Academy, and they said, yeah, come on, come on down. We'll, we'll talk to you about it. And so we started research. We started hanging around researching uh, the what was then called the investigative support unit, part of the behavioral science unit. And um, I got to know the people. We started looking into a case uh, and I got to meet this legendary profile. He wasn't known to the public yet, but, but, but uh, he was uh, certainly known to law enforcement, John Douglas, who was really the father of criminal profiling as we know it today. And he was the head of the unit. And I actually wrote a novel called uh, The Edge, in which I used him as a character once I learned what it was all about. We did a film called Mind of a Serial Killer. It was nominated for a National Emmy. It did very well on PBS. Uh, the behavioral science units actually got a many more requests for help every time it was on PBS. And then, I don't know how long, much time later, uh, I'd gotten to know John pretty well. He called me uh, at home and said, I'm getting ready to retire from the FBI. And do you think anybody would be interested in my story? And if they are, would you do it with me? And I said, well, I'm certainly interested in your story. Let's, let's see um, who else is. So we went to New York with with my uh, my literary agent at the time. We went around, made the rounds to uh, uh, a number of publishers. I'm sure the success of Silence of the Lambs helped us a lot. And we got a number of offers. Uh, we ended up going with Scribner, part of Simon & Schuster. Um, probably one of the cleverest things I did was come up with the name Mindhunter, because uh, that <clears throat> really became a brand for us. And um, the book, did really well, became a New York Times bestseller. And so we just kind of kept going. And uh, now wow. we've been doing these books um, since the uh, since the mid 1990s. So it's like 25 years and uh, still growing, going strong. And we haven't uh, haven't un I guess in a way, unfortunately, we haven't run out of things to uh, to uh, write about yet. And Again, unfortunately, uh, the killer's shadow is extremely relevant today. Um, you know, Joseph Paul Franklin was uh, executed in, I think, 2006. But um, unfortunately, his length and shadow still still roams the land. Um, 9, June 9, 2015, uh, Dylan Roof, this uh, white supremacist, punk kid goes into the Emmanuel African Methodist uh, Episcopal Church in Charleston, yep. South Carolina. He's welcomed by the congregation to a Bible study course. He sits there with them. They give him food and drink. He sits there with them for 45 minutes. And then all of a sudden, he opens up his satchel, starts shooting, and kills them all. Uh, I mean that's calculating. Many, I mean that is very just, calculated. And what's very interesting, and what's very interesting is why did he do it? For the same exact reason as Joseph Paul Franklin. He wanted to start a race war. And you know what? Even after he was uh, uh, sentenced to death and is and is in federal prison, um, he's he's not. He said he wasn't concerned about that um, because. Once the race war actually happened, the white supremacists who won were going to break him out of prison and he would be a hero, just like Joseph Paul Franklin thought he wow. would. All right, you go two years, 
two years later, um, August 2017, Charlottesville, Virginia, the Unite the Right rally. Um, now, we all know that somebody was killed there, but what else do we know? You have all of these white supremacists, or are they just um, are they just people who are interested in history and want to preserve the statue of Robert E. Lee there? Um, and 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 to show how interested they are in history and how important this Confederate heritage is, what do they do? They they march down the street on mass, carrying tiki torches, like it's a Nuremberg rally. And they yep. chant, blood and soil, and Jews will not replace us. Blood and soil is one of the key slogans of the Nazi party. It, uh, and yep. Jews will not replace us. We're not going to let the Jews take over, manipulate, and bring in all these mongrel races to replace this flower of, uh, of white supremacy that we represent. And of course... These guys, I mean, you just you can just look at them and see how inadequate they are, see what losers they are, see how what their deep seated inadequacies are. And yet at the same time, the sense of entitlement, the sense of resentment that they're not getting what they're due. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, it, I, I, agree, I agree completely. So in other I, words, I guess what I'm saying is Joseph Paul Franklin is dead, but his spiritual children are alive and well, unfortunately. And, you know, look, we can give all the cliches, you know, there were people, fine people on both sides of this. Yeah, the people mm -hmm. who were shouting blood and soil and Jews will not replace us. Very fine people. Yes, no question about it. Yeah, it's just, it's one of those things, that the people that didn't stand up, that just stood there along the sides watching, you know, it's the same thing. It's it, it you know, and, what and it, one, of the, one of the things that bothers me, Craig, and I don't know if, you, you know, how you guys must feel it down in Florida, too. It's like we have two different realities going on in this country now. I mean, just yesterday or the day before, you've got a um, you've got a Republican uh, um, QAnon Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, and she says she does, having to wear a mask when uh, for for COVID nineteen. Now, she knows how the Jews in Germany felt having to wear the yellow star, which she called the gold star, by the way. But yeah. I mean, how you can compare, how you can compare the, the slaughter of six million innocent people with having to wear a mask to prevent spread of a deadly disease is just mind blowing to me. But this is all part of the same ball of wax, unfortunately. Yeah, it's no, it, it, that's one of those things. Too. It's just it, it's it's crazy. But I hate a lot of those comparisons where people just like this is the same thing. It's not the same. No, it's not the same thing. No, it, at all. Um, and it was one of those kind of like where the thing is just so. And this this might even really clut Clunda is one of the things I want to ask you is what was the biggest lesson that you've learned from your so far with your time with John that you really picked up on. And I said, no, I, you know, one of the, one of the things is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff that goes on in the world, but there's also a lot of really good people too. And uh, I've been tremendous, you know, both John and I have been very involved with the victims rights movement. And you see, um, you see what happens when, People are transposed and transfigured by tragedy. I mean, um, you know, they will look at the George Floyd uh, situation, mm -hmm. for example. Um, what a horrible situation. But look at the good and look at the awareness that's come out of that. Um, you know, so I, I, I hope it's long lasting. Um, I hope the fact that our current president welcomed the family to the White House yesterday, I mean, I hope that's symbolically important, um, as opposed to the last president, you know, who makes a, uh, a, a you know, false equivalency between both sides of the uh, uh, Unite the Right rally. Um, you know, that's what I mean when I say we have two different uh, 
sets of reality going on in this country. And, um, you know, when you get to be my age and you've seen as much as I have, you say, you see it. Oh, I don't, I yep. don't, know. but, uh, I guess to answer your question directly, uh, Craig, I think one of the things that, um, I've learned from John, and I think it's both the essence of being a good human being, I hope, and also the essence of being a good detective or a good profiler is a sense of empathy of being able to put yourself in the position of another person. Um, you know, there's this old joke that um, never judge a person until you've walked a mile in his shoes, because by then you'll be a mile away and you'll have his shoes. But that's yeah. the, real side. <laughs> the real side is you've got to have empathy and understanding to do your job and and to be a good human being i think and um with all due respect i think that's what we've been lacking in this country to uh to a large extent oh yeah no there's been a lot of people it's just it's you know so ingrained it's like you're so willing to focus on what where your differences are and that's all you yeah. want to focus that, on that's a good point yeah yeah it's Austin had shared a while ago, it was just, it was a nice little meme, you know, where it just said, it's a jar of ants. You got the black ants and the red ants and shake it. And it was, that wasn't you. That was from Austin. Yes, it was. No, it wasn't. It was from me. You shared something else. Oh, it, it, anyway. So it, I don't think that's the point of arguing who shared it. Um, We're a family. Here. Way to, way to make it about you, Chris. So anyway, let's get, let's get back to the, let's get back to the story while Chris is being selfish over there. So, uh, yeah. So you shake the jar of the black and the red ants, you know, and they're attacking each other and everybody's fo so focused on fighting each other that they don't realize that, you know, they're in a jar that's being shook. Right. You know, yeah. so you're trying to, you know, and that's, that's one of those, that's one of those things, you know, it's, it's I think if people just found that there's a commonality, you know, we could start getting past these things and actually, you know, start to heal. I mean, it's, well, it's I, one of the I biggest think things. I think that's really important. And, you know, one of the other subjects I, I write about, uh, in addition to my work with John, is I write about public health. And I've been writing a lot about um, COVID. And uh, I have, uh, if I have it anywhere nearby, here we go. Um, I wrote a book several years ago with Dr. Michael Osterholm of the University of Minnesota, who you've probably seen on television, called Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs. We wrote this hmm. in 20, it came out in 2017. Interestingly enough, almost nobody uh, read it at the time. Um, and son suddenly, once COVID started, um, went on the New York Times bestseller list. So, you know, maybe we were just too early. Wow. What's interesting is our chapter on coronaviruses was called SARS and MERS, harbingers of things to come. And it's, yeah. not we're, and it's not because we're psychic again. This is just like profile. <laughs> it's not because we're psychic. It's not because we're particularly smart. We just saw what was going on. We observed what was going yep. on and saw that another um, epidemic was inevitable. But the point I wanted to make about that, Craig, because apropos of what you were just talking about is um, Will Durant, who wrote with his wife, Ariel, wrote the epic, uh, how many volumes set, set, the story of civilization. He, um, he once said, what would it take to unite the whole world to do something good? And he decided the only thing he could think of that would unite the whole world was an alien invasion yep. from another planet. And he said, if there was an alien invasion, we would have to work together. So why can't we think of other things, whether it's COVID, whether it's smallpox, whether it's, you know, whatever, whether it's the next uh, epic uh, influenza, which is probably going to be the next big pandemic. Why can't we think of that as the invader and all work together and get over our differences that way? And if we could do that, if we could work together on that, maybe we'd start learning to work together on other things. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Yeah, de definitely. You know, That's... I think one of the one of the things which you alluded to before um, is, and I think it's very true, is if we can stop to think about it, and we can stop trying to play off each other for incidental or insignificant gain or advantage, we have a lot more in common than our differences. And what you know, maybe we could start 
maybe we could start playing that up. I mean, we all come from common yep. ancestors. We all started with the same language, you know, all of that. And just get past, you know, but unfortunately, like I said, you know, which is a theme of a few of your books. There's mm -hmm. some people that just cannot get past that. I mean, that's right. That's right. And they're trying to compensate for their own inadequacies by taking it out on other people. And unfortunately, um, that's when you're talking about serial killers and predators, this is the most important thing in their lives. This is what they live for. They may have jobs. They may have spouses. They may have children like uh, um, Dennis Rader, the BTK strangler from Wichita, Kansas. He had all of these things. And yet these, what he called his projects, where he would break into houses and, dis, uh, and neutralize people and tie them up and take great pleasure in sitting there and watching them die. This was what was most important to him in life. This was what yeah. he lived for. And with Joseph Paul Franklin killing these black people, these mixed race couples, these Jews, this is what he lived for. And this is what he thought God wanted him to do. God is always on the side of everybody, as, as you know. Um, and uh, this is what he, uh, yep. why, why did the Ku Klux Klan burn crosses? Because God is on their side. This is what, you know, God wants the races to be separate, whatever. Um, you know, he wants all, he wants all the Jews killed because they killed Christ, whatever. Um, but the point is, this is what they, this is what's most important to them. And I think the, and, um, when we were deciding to do this book, this is, this is the beginning of a series on individual cases. Most of the books that John and I have done in the past have taken more themes and done a lot of different killers and cases to represent them. This is a series of books we're now doing for Harper Collins on individual cases. And our editor said, well, w w which one do you want to start with? And we said, well, we have a lot of choices. Uh, what do you think? And he said, well, he said, John, what's, what's one, give, give us a, give us a case that really affected you more than a lot of the others and tell me why. And I said, well, I, I know one. And, uh, he said, what's that? And I said, Joseph Paul Franklin. And he said, why is that? I said, what? He said, why did that affect John more than some of the others? And I said, well, a couple of reasons. First of all, he was very prolific, very interesting case because he was very prolific, killed so many people over such mm -hmm. a wide area. But also because most serial killers, these sexually based ones, the ones who were just doing it for their own uh for their own sexual gratification or their own inadequacy and on that level. I mean, maybe a few total weirdos are going to look up to them, but basically, I mean, these are scum. These are people who, you know, nobody's going to be really emulating, but somebody like Joseph Paul Franklin, you get the wrong kind of person, the kind of person like, Dylan Roof in Charleston, South Carolina, the kind mm -hmm. of people like the Unite the Right rally in, uh, in Charlottesville, people are going to look up to him. In other words, what he does is what he did is transferable. It's repeatable. It's, it can go on and on. It has a life of its own. And that's what's so terrifying about a guy like Joseph Paul Franklin. Yeah. And that, that was one of the, you were saying prolific guys, just like, I mean, you know, Missouri, Wisconsin, Tennessee, Georgia, Virginia, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Utah. I mean, he's everywhere. I mean, this is just. Yeah. Plus, he's robbing banks in Alabama, Mississippi, all over the place. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, he was, and I didn't realize this until I was reading the book. So he was apprehended in Lakeland, Florida. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, you know, and that's, that's a half hour from where I currently live. Yeah, it you know, is where you know is where he was, and so I was like, "Oh my God, that's you know, this backyard." John here. said, "Look, he's going down south. He's going to find his ex-wife. He's going to be he's going to be looking for family. He's going to be he's not going to rob a bank because he knows that they all have cameras. But he's going to have to do something to uh, to get some money. And um, we know he's going to go back to where he his comfort zone, which is the south, with the area from you know kind of Alabama up through um, up through." Uh, Florida. And, uh, and what's he going to do? Well, we know he sold his blood in the past. So 
that's what he's probably going to do just to get money while he's on the lam and he knows people are looking for him and he can use an assumed name and there won't be any uh and there won't be any uh uh, cameras like uh, surveillance cameras at this point, like they're 1980, like there would be in a bank, even in those mm -hmm. days. And that's where they end up catching him. And fortunately, um, the FBI had been into this particular blood bank uh, ahead of time and they'd shown the picture. And, um, you know, this is so, yeah, you, you have to be able to anticipate what they're doing and you don't just make it up. It's based on what their previous experience is and what kind of profile you've created of them. Now, that was an incredible part is just, you know, yeah. just that ability. You guys were to figure that out, what he was going to do. It's like you, yeah. you're able to see. I mean, that's where we, I told you is about the witchcraft well, and, and black magic. It's like you guys saw in the future. It's like, yeah. And you know, go. If you look this guy up, uh, you'll see articles from close to when he was, um, um, executed or late in his life where he says, well, maybe I was wrong about the Jews. Maybe I was wrong about uh, African-Americans and all of that. But we've got some letters that he wrote to John, um, you know, when he'd been in prison for quite a while. This is after John had uh, done an extensive interview with him uh, just to find out as much as he could about uh, what made this guy tick. And this guy is full of, you know, he's using the N word all over the place. He's talking about you know, if this happened to your daughter, you wouldn't, you know, if, if, if he brought home, uh, if she brought home an N word, you wouldn't, you know, you'd feel a lot differently and all that. So I didn't see any evidence that this guy had reformed, that this guy was at all, um, had any remorse about what he has done. I think he considered himself a hero for what he did. Was, was it more of like remorse for, you know, for the fact, being like caught. some of these people for being caught, yeah, for yeah. being caught, you know, yeah, these, these guys all have feel sorry afterwards, but they feel sorry that they're caught. No, here's the one thing you can't you can lock up the body, but the one thing you, you can't lock up the mind. I mean, and so many of these guys, I mean, if you if you could probe Dennis Rader's uh psyche today in uh in prison in Utah, I would bet every night he's just reliving these murders reliving the thrill he got from uh from what he did and with him the particularly th i mean you know the torture was good the uh the you know tying mm -hmm. people up the ropes were good all of that but what he really enjoyed what really you know made him feel alive was the power of life and death and watching as these as the life drained out of these people that's what was important to him and I'll and I'll bet he's reliving that right now in prison. Now the finding religion, you know, because a lot of them, you know, suddenly convert. Yeah, well, you to, know, some do of you think? Do. do you think that's? Do you think that's them trying to bring attention back on them themselves? I think like to for, some extent it is. I think to some of them it gives them a new meaning. And uh, you know, as John says, put somebody in prison for twenty or thirty years, they got nothing else to do. Um, you know, yeah, well, maybe they will find religion. Um, son of Sam, you know, converted from Judaism and is now a, uh, uh, David Berkowitz is now a, um, you know, a minister in prison. You know, whatever, you know, I don't know. I think that um, what, I, what I know is that if, he, if each of these guys, if they had not been caught, they would have kept on killing. Uh, which, yeah. you know, which brings up another question um, about, rehabilitation and one thing you could say is uh, these are the words of dr stanton Samanow, a very prominent forensic psychologist who we've worked with a lot and he says how do you rehabilitate someone who hasn't been habilitated in the first place uh, that's difficult. that's a great point it's, I mean, it's, that's that's very difficult to do and yeah. you, you we, we mentioned the manson family before you know the few of them are still alive and mm -hmm. in prison do I think that any of them are dangerous anymore? Absolutely not. Do I think that the ones who are left are probably remorseful at this point for what they've done? Probably are. On the other hand, and they're not dangerous anymore. On the other hand, I've seen the crime scene photos. I've oh. read the autopsy protocols. I've seen the body of eight month pregnant Sharon Tate stabbed multiple, multiple times to death. Um, and the question you have to ask yourself is, 
can that ever be forgiven? I mean, is it, does it just, does society have to keep these people in prison, even if they're not dangerous anymore, even if they're remorseful, just because of the enormity of what they've done? I mean, I don't have a good answer for that, but I submit that, you know, some things are just too horrible to, uh, you know, to forgive. And which brings up another question, which we come up with against all the time, uh, which is, um, are you as bad as the worst thing you've ever done? And if you're a cold blooded killer, I would submit that, yeah, you are. Yeah. Oh God. It's, you're like you said, you're just, as you're going through those things, if any, I mean, I don't recommend people just, you know, just go check out these things for the thrill, but I mean, yeah, those, those murders are, Oh, they're horrific. Yeah, and I, I think you, you know, you know, I do want to bring up another point that you just reminded me of, Craig. I think it's very important, which is, you know, people say, okay, well, why do you write so much about crime? I mean, why do you write about these lurid, titillating subjects? And I think one of the reasons, well, first of all, as I hope this show demonstrates, people are interested. But why are they interested? Mm -hmm. I think they're interested, first of all, because they're living, you know, on the edge vicariously through these things. You know, everybody wants a thrill, if you will. But also, I think this, I think when you write about true crime, you're writing about, you know, what we in literary terms call the human condition. But it's the human condition writ large at the very extremes. I mean, we all feel, you know, these emotions of love, hate, envy, jealousy, resentment, uh, joy, whatever. But these are carried to the extremes. These are people who have no filters. We're seeing how people react at the extremes of society and how um, and how people deal with their worst possible with the worst possible thing that can happen. And then sometimes there really is great spiritual triumph afterwards. I mean nobody would choose to be in that that situation. But um, I am continually amazed in my dealing with um, victims, uh, uh, families of, of, of crime victims, um, how much heroism and, um, and, and just spirituality, you know, that they bring to, uh, to their terrible situations. So I think this really is about, you know, one of the reasons people do read this, why we have so many readers, why there's so many television shows. I think people really are interested in knowing why people do the things they do. Yeah. April said, you know, like you also, you know, it's, it's educating. I mean, it's one of the it's that saying, if you don't oh, pay so, attention to history, you're doomed yeah. to repeat it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, out. And, you know, I think um, profiling has many, uh, many applications. For instance, um, you know, I don't know if any of you three guys have young children, but mm -hmm. um, uh, if you have a five-year, four or five-year-old uh, son or daughter, who gets lost in the shopping mall, you know, when we, when we were, when we were growing up, um, we were all told, don't talk to strangers, you know, strangers are dangerous. Don't talk to strangers. Well, if you're a four or five year old who's lost in a shopping mall, telling you not to talk to strangers is not very helpful. What, yeah. what, what you've got to, what <laughs> instead you've got to teach that child to be a profiler, to be, to talk, to, to figure out, okay, which strangers are okay for me to talk to? Which are the ones who are going to help me as opposed to which are the ones who are going to hurt me? And you know what? You can teach a four or five-year-old to be a profiler. Okay, who are the people who are safe? Who are the, who are the people that we should tell them to, uh, to uh, approach? Somebody in a uniform. Somebody with a name tag on. Uh, a pregnant woman a woman with children, even a man with children. You know, those are the kind of people who would, somebody behind a desk, any of those kind of people are, are generally safe. Those, those are your best bets. So that's what I mean when I say we've got to use profiling in everyday life. Yeah, I, I, that's, I agree. That's, no, it, it's, that. I, I just, Man, I'm just looking at the time. The time is just it's flying by. This is fun. I, I'm just, it's one of those. It's, I, we, well, we let, definitely me, have to do. let me tell you guys, when you get to be my age, the time really goes by fast. <laughs> so, oh, God. Um, but 
I'll tell you, I have I have one trick for slowing it down and getting to appreciate every moment. If you feel like your life is going by too fast, get on the treadmill. It'll slow down real quick. Oh, yeah, isn't that, that the truth? That, that 40 <laughs> minutes I spend on the treadmill seems like hours and hours and hours. We we do this workout. It's this fitness challenge thing. I'm telling you, 30 se- you know, a minute of a plank seems oh, yeah. to take an eternity. You're yeah. like as you're everything's shaking, you're looking up like it's got to be close. Uh, yeah, 20 seconds went by. You're like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's the theory of relativity applied to everyday life. Oh no, it's it, it's a little unrelated. But have you watched the show Clarice? I haven't yet. You know, I I, I keep meaning to. I I just haven't. But I uh, I do want to. Is it any good? Yes, I I actually really like it. I mean, right. but then I'm again, gonna, I'm not. I'm going to start not, from the beginning and watch it. Yeah, I'm not an expert, you know, in the profiling field like you know with you guys. So I mean, you're going to probably have a whole other take on it, but definitely because it's based off of it takes place like right after Buffalo Bill. Okay, so between between the two books, yeah. Oh, so so right yeah, after, so right after yes. Silence of the Lambs. Okay, yeah. So right after Silence of the Lambs is done. Buffalo Bill has been, yeah. you know, now it's Clarice okay, as yeah, she's Mona Pennington likes Clarice. Okay, so Mona, yep. I'm going to check it out. Yeah, so it's that one. You know, if anybody hasn't watched it on Netflix, uh, Mine Hunter, gotta check that out. That is a fantastic one. Hope we're still hoping hope, for season three. We're, we're yeah, waiting. that's what I was just gonna say. They got two seasons. I'm hoping for season three to come out. I know the actors um, definitely want to do it. I mean, but they guys. But the way, like you said, just the book. I mean, we we just kind of we didn't get into a whole lot of his thing just due to lack of time for it. But I mean, I'm. Can you tease who the next book's going to be about? Yes, Are you I, able to talk? Uh, yeah. The next book is uh, is um, called, and I think this is the first time we've announced this publicly. So Ooh, it's going to be called nice. When a Killer Calls, and it's about the murder of two young women, uh, actually one young woman and one girl in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, um, by a serial killer named Larry Jean Bell. And this was a very interesting, a very tragic case but a very interesting case in which profiling, out and out detective work, and very sophisticated forensic science all came together to stop a serial killer in his tracks. Oh, that's awesome! That's awesome. Well, I appreciate it. And I'm I hope glad to, I asked that and question. I'm, and I'm desperately trying to finish it. I hope to be finished by the middle of next month. <laughs> and then, so and they can put it out whenever they want. Oh, great! That's I said it. This I mean for anybody, guys, killers shadow. John Douglas and Mark Olshager, you guys, I mean, modern, modern day Sherlock Holmes and Watson. I mean, it's, you guys have done a fantastic work on this. I mean, I can, yeah, for how well this is, I can only imagine that the other books, you know, they don't disappoint either. Cause this one, I mean, I, even this, we didn't really talk into it. It's just, it's broken into two parts too. You have, you know, part two is into the mind. Yeah, you know, is where you break into. Yeah. And so, first, first part is about catching this guy. Second part is prosecuting him and figuring out why he did what he did. Yeah, it's so everybody. Amazon, like I said, go. I said you go to mindhuntersinc dot com. Yeah, just go to Amazon, gonna, and look us up. You'll find us. Yep, and I'm going to share that real quick here on the screen so that everybody who's who's watching can see this too. Very good. And this has so there's there's. There's the there's a the partner Here's right John. there, yep. yep. There's so yeah, you've got. I said links to there. You've got links, you know, pictures of you guys, you guys together. The books yeah. and your books. By the way, if you uh, if you'd rather listen to the book than read it, um, it the audio book is narrated by Holt McCallany, who is one of our two stars of the Mindhunter television show, and our um, previous book, uh, The Killer Across the Table. Uh, which is about interviewing these people uh, in in the prisons and what they're like and how you do that and how you comp- compile a profile. That is uh, narrated by Jonathan Goff, Groff, who is the other star, the one who actually plays the John character in Mindhunter. Oh wow, that's that's awesome. So that's that's going to be that's going to be an amazing, you know, narration. Yeah, they're both really good, and they're both really great guys. Yeah, it's it's. 
one uh, we may have to you know break it so if if you're up to you know if you wouldn't mind would we be able to pre-book you for when that one's yeah, released or, or you, guys, uh, you guys are great awesome that's that, that's that's perfect that's see good job guys good job <laughs> we got him to come back that's a that's the just i mean we would some point like i said i would even like to get you, you know your partner on as well yeah. john i'll let him know yeah yeah because that's that's something just with the profiling it's like really taking a fascination with this i mean i've been taken in like i mean i've already watched the entire mind hunter seasons i mean I've pretty much anything that comes out like i've just started watching the one i'm on sam little mm -hmm. you know so i would take you know so that's that's a crazy no, one too there's no end of material as you know unfortunately unfortunately no so but Mark, appreciate you coming on the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you thank guys you so for having me. Yeah. And everybody, once we again, enjoyed it. Killer thank Shadow. You, go go pick up the book now. Go to Mindhunters Inc. Like I said, dot com. Support these guys. Buy this book. Tr trust me, you are not going to regret reading this one. This one's actually, it's it's one of those page turners. Even though you know the results, you're still like, you know, okay, I want to keep going. And pretty soon you're like, oh, I got to get to bed. <laughs> sorry, 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 midnight. So, all right, well, have a great night. We'll be in Thank touch, like I said. And def so, keep us in the thing when it's going to be released. That'll be fantastic. Stay well. All right, you too. Right. All right, everybody, this is brought to you by Nanny Cakes. Nancy Burke, go to Nanny Cakes 407 on Facebook, 407 923 2898. And if you want to go to our page and weigh on on the debate, who posted that meme first? Was it Austin or was it Chris? Was it Chris or was it Austin? We will start a poll and see who we see. See so we come like this. Go back, you know, for the sleuths. Maybe we'll give the winner who solves this one, you know, we'll send them a sticker or something like that. We'll, you know, maybe we'll do something like that. So everybody go to check us out on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, both at three underscore beards underscore podcast or at beards vault uh, patriot radio download the xeno radio app we are rebroadcast every thursday night at 10 p.m courtesy of j and j beard company at go to jjbeardco.com thank you everybody for watching we really appreciate it please like subscribe follow anything and everything you can that has three beards podcast on it and other, other stuff too. I don't want to be selfish, but Hey, everybody, thanks for watching. Appreciate it. We will see you next week where we have a couple of guests coming up to, we have Richard Sullivan. We're going to be talking about symbolism in cinema. And then we also have Richard Eastep. He's coming on. We're going to talk all, well, we're going to repeat the serial killer show. We're going to talk about other serial killers in his book, serial killers. Kind of, you know, it's, Hey, I set it up perfectly there. Didn't I? Awesome. Good night. <laughs>